many are happy to be in the house of the Lord today, this morning. Hallelujah. How many are glad to be here? How many are praising our Lord for keeping us throughout this week? This is a reason to celebrate. Hallelujah. Can you help me praise the name of the Lord? Don't let it stop there. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Let's glorify him in this place. Clap your hands. Stomp your feet. Lift up a shout unto the Lord. Hallelujah is the highest praise. Hallelujah is the highest praise. We have to be glad this morning. The Bible says, I will rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in him right now. Hey, me glad. Oh, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're feeling in your body, God said, if you worship me, truth, I'll take care of everything else. Focus our attention on the kingdom of God. Things will be added. Praise him right now. Dare you to worship him. Even in the midst of your troubles, in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of your in the midst of your sickness, I challenge you right now to worship him. And watch my God work it all out. Watch my God do the impossible. Because the Bible said with God, there's nothing impossible for him. Your healing is in your worship. Your delivery is in your worship. Your breakthrough is through your worship. He can make it all happen if you can just trust him. He said, can you worship Can you me. No matter what it feels like, it looks like, no matter what you got, as soon as you step outside of this place, can you no, worship me? Can, can you lift up a hallelujah? Can you lift up a can you lift up I need that I'm without you, Lord? Can you stand up God, I love you. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me. Thank you for keeping our family. Thank you for keeping our children and children and our great grandchildren. Thank you, God, that you are a God of promises for generation after generation after generation. Our Lord, right this morning, we pray. Write what you're doing. You can up your heart. He said, worship he is, he is a protecting God. He is a providing God. He is a loving God. He is a forgiving God. Can you praise Him? Can you praise Him? Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Oh, humble yourself. Humble yourself before his presence because he's right here. So humble yourself. Forget about yourself. You're nothing without him. So focus attention on him right now. Focus undivided attention on him right now and glorify his name. Bless him right now in this place. Bless him right now where you sit, where you stand, where you serve. Bless him right now. He calls for that right now. We are created to worship him daily, daily worship. So when we come together on Sunday morning, it should be like a wildfire happening because we've done it all week. This is the rehearsal. This is where you need to get your practice in because when we get to glory, it's 24-7, never-ending praise, never-ending worship. This is where it happens right now. So I'm going to tell you, get your praise on right now. Get your worship on right now, right while you still have breath in your body. Get your worship on right now. He is an awesome God, awesome God. And we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, God.
This morning's scripture reading is coming from Isaiah 57, verse 15. And it reads, this is the NIV version. For this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the spirit of the contrite. This week, in the media, we have heard about those who have felt hopeless and who have taken their own life. We are reminded through his word that there is nothing too hard for him, nothing too difficult that he won't forgive, nothing too difficult that he won't see us through. He just requires for us to surrender to him. Surrender to him because his word just said he revives the spirit of the lowly and he revives the heart of the contrite. We have hope in him. We have love in him. Unconditional love, I might add. Good morning, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We bow down to you, Holy Spirit. We lay aside every weight. We permanently lay aside every weight before your throne. We bless you for your forgiveness. We bless you for your love, but most importantly, we bless you for your power to break chains of depression, to break chains of sadness, to break chains of hopelessness. Father, we thank you. It is by your power and your anointing that we stand here today. Thank you for new mercies and grace on this morning. Thank you for your unmerited favor on this morning. It is because of you that we move and we have our being. So for that we say thank you. We hope in you. We will love in you. We will have joy in you. No matter how it feels, no matter what it looks like, We have hope in you because of the blood of your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us. It is through him that everything that we experience, you will see us through. We just have to trust and believe and obey and eat on your word day in and day out. Worship you in spirit and in truth. You have not failed us, therefore we will not fail you. There are so many people who are hurting. So many people who are looking for the Savior. Let us be the vessels to provide you as their hope. We will be obedient. Where you say go, we will go. We will be obedient. What you say, we will say. We will be obedient. For this world needs you. And we are grateful to have you. It is in your son Jesus' name that do we do pray. And every heart says amen. Amen, 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 amen. 
We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We thank you. Bless your name. What? 
worship you. I worship you. Bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, God. I said, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Come on, keep clapping. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We make a miracle worker, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, come on, come on, sing it with us. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Mm. Way make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Come on, come on. Yes, Lord. Mm. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Come on, sing that with us. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Dear gracious and merciful Father, we come to you as humble as we know how just to say we love you, Lord. For this is the day that you have made, O oh Lord, and we are glad as we rejoice in it, O oh Lord. We thank you for leaning down from heaven to be with us this morning, O oh Lord. We thank you for allowing us to gather in this space with you, Lord, your dwelling place, your sanctuary, your Holy Spirit, your presence is with us, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, we ask that you give us understanding of your word. You've made it plain and clear. You've spoken to me, Lord. Now I ask that you speak to your people, O oh Lord. Decrease me so that your word increase, Lord. Remove me, hide me behind your cross. I am nothing without you, O oh Lord. We need you to speak, Lord. I want them to make sure that they hear you and not me, O oh Lord. Use me. I need you, Lord. Speak, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit speak into our hearts, speak into our being, and we'll be so careful to give you all the praise and the glory. It is in your son Jesus Christ's name that we release this prayer. Let us all say amen. 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 Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise. We can't thank him enough for what he has done in our life. Amen. We are in this series of When Jesus Calls. This is our second week of a series of When Jesus Calls. And last week we were talking about uh, Jesus and his um, calling of Peter, and he said to follow me essentially. Well, today we're going to be talking about another uh, scenario that took place in the life of Peter, and it's when uh, uh, the, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Amen? Behold the Lamb of God. So turn with me, if you will. No, first let's go back and recap. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, and it'll be in front of you as well. 
While he was walking, I'm going to walk around a little bit today. It makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. While he was while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, uh, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting the net into the sea, uh, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers. Fishers of men. Here's the important piece for the day. Immediately they dropped their nets and followed him. Amen? Immediately they dropped their nets and followed him. I don't know about you, but there's only been a, a few rare occasions where someone has spoken to me and I immediately dropped what I was doing to follow them. Many of you can relate if you think about your job. There's been times in your life when uh, uh, your boss called your office and you immediately stop what you're doing to answer the call. If your boss stopped by your office physically, knocks on the door, put their head inside of the doorway of your office, you immediately stop what you're doing and you follow instruction, all right? And, and for me, it got even on a personal level. When I was married, early in the marriage, uh, uh, and I, I don't do it as much as I should now, but early in the marriage, when my wife said something, because I was in this relationship with her and I loved her dearly, I stopped what I was doing, and then I followed instruction. And if you ask her today, she'd probably say, nah, that don't work quite as smooth as it used to, but that's 21 years of marriage. I'm still working on it. I'm in under development, right? Um, so, and then there were times in my life because my kids were little once upon a time and they were babies. And when you hear the baby cry, when your child reach out their hands to you, no matter what's going on in those very moments, we stop what we're doing and follow them. We follow them to give them instructions. We want to protect them. We want to help guide them. We want to love on them. So there are moments in your life, no matter if it's your, uh, the relationship you're in, no matter the supervisor that you have, or even a special child in your life, there's just certain people in your life that when they speak, when they beckon and call for you, you will stop what you're doing and follow them. Well, I, I thought that was an interesting concept that God had laid on my heart because I, I was wondering to myself, I said, well, God, why is it that pe certain people can enter in our life and we can stop and then follow? Well, we are obedient to people we value and that we feel are important. You stop what you're doing to follow when there's someone that you value or you feel like they're very important. In other words, there is a relationship associated with your followership. Amen? So if you value the person greatly, you'll follow them. But, and if they're important to you, you'll follow them. But here's the danger. When you place value on people, and you place importance on people, that means then their value is limited because you also have the ability to take value away from them. And so John the Baptist is, is explaining to these disciples, there's someone that's going to come greater than me. In other words, until we understand that uh, um, the person that you value, until you understand their importance to the world, you'll always keep them in the value system you've created for them. What am I saying? Uh, come up here, babe. I value my wife, but there are moments in the relationship where I can devalue her because I place value on her. Y'all getting this? All right, come here, Cody. Stand on the other side of her. Watch this. I value my wife. And so the value that I have is because I'm in a relationship with her. She's important to me. She means the world to me. So I value her greatly. I can take away my value because I can get upset with her and then I lessen, minimize, decrease who she is in my life. So I can take away value. But see, that's the flesh. Once I understand that her value is greater 
then I can have greater importance when I think of her. How is it done? Here it is. In order for me to understand fully what God has given me as a spouse, as a friend in our marriage and relationship, is for me to understand she's important to other people. So her importance to other people, come up here, Sierra. Her importance to other people, stand next to Cody, which is our daughter now. Here's a friend and a daughter. So I have to understand I can never devalue her because she means more to the world than she do to me. See, this is why we give people too much credit and, 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 and we, uh, um, we give people too much credit and then when they devalue us, we, want, we wonder why. Why are you mistreating me? Why don't you value me? You got caught in this first relationship. What I want you to understand is it's your importance outside of the initial relationship that keeps your value. In order for me to deepen my understanding of my wife is to understand that she's valuable and she means much to other people. You may be seated. Thank you. Listen. John, Peter and Andrew are in the boat. Last week we read, Jesus presses upon them. It says, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they drop their nets. We only, make, we only make those type of decisions when we understand the relationship that we're in. So how did they drop their nets and immediately follow him? follow him because they didn't have a prior relationship? So how is it Peter and Andrew say, I'm going to follow Jesus. They have no prior relationship. There's no immediate relationship. Jesus is not their mentor. Jesus is not their boss. Jesus is not their spouse. Jesus ain't even really, at that point, really their friend. So how is it that Peter and Andrew can drop what they're doing and follow Jesus? John the Baptist helped them understand in the example I just placed before you that the one that is coming is greater than who I am. See, Peter and Andrew were disciples of John the Baptist. So they're under the tutelage of John the Baptist. So what John the Baptist helped them understand, and I was praying to God, I said, God, help me understand how they can drop what they're doing and immediately go with them. They don't know Jesus like that. John the Baptist made Jesus greater than what they understood. His importance to the world was greater. My, important, my understanding of who my wife is to me is great. But what's greater is who she is to others. Because God just didn't create her just for me and only me. She has a job. She has children. She has sisters in Christ. She got people she's going to bump into. She's more important to all these other people. But if I just say, you only are uh, uh, committed to me, I will lock her in and actually keep her hostage. So she can't fulfill her mission in Christ because she is stuck here with me. So I have to understand if she says to me, one of my sisters in Christ needs prayer, I gotta go to her house, I gotta say, bless you and you go. Cause she means much more. What happens then when I understand that she means so much more to other people, I have greater value in her. Because I understand spiritually God created her to be in my world, but God also created her to touch all these other lives. So Andrew and Peter are in the boat. Jesus says, follow me. And they immediately drop their nets and go. They immediately drop their nets and go. I said, I still don't get it, God. How did John the Baptist prepare them? Remember, John the Baptist was sent by God to prepare the people for the Messiah coming. Let's skip ahead. They saw greater value in the one who was coming than the one who was. See, John the Baptist helped them understand that there is someone coming greater than our mentor. When you want to learn from the person that your mentor is learning from, it's one thing to have a mentor in your life, but you want to know 
if I'm your pastor, you, want, you not only want to know me, you want to know where I'm getting this information from. So you not only want to know me, you want to know, well, who are you talking to to get this information? In other words, Peter and Andrew says, there must be something that I need to take from this experience uh, uh, so that I can walk away from John the Baptist. We're talking about the person that's preaching, teaching, and baptizing people in water. He has significant value. He knows the Old Testament. And Peter and Andrew, by just Jesus saying, follow me, I will make you uh, fishers of men. They drop their nets. I love it. But I still didn't get it. I said, God, I still didn't get it. How did John the Baptist get them to understand that the one that is coming is greater? Here's what happened. In Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 29, the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who... Uh, 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 reigns before me because he was before me. John is teaching. He's baptizing. He's ordered by God, but he's letting the people know there's someone that's coming after me that was before me. Someone is coming after me. There's something greater coming after me, but he was before me. That's beautiful. It comes after him, but it was in existence before him. So the next day, John had another word. The next day again, John was standing with the two of his disciples, Andrew and Peter, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. This is before the incident on the boat. The incident on the boat was their second call. This is their first call. See, Andrew, like some of us, is a person that's not always talking. Andrew is a listener. Andrew was created to bring people to Jesus. So when Andrew heard John the Baptist talking, Andrew runs and gets his brother Peter and says, hey, this is the Messiah that we heard about. Now they're standing together with John the Baptist. This is a beautiful thing because not everyone needs to be talking. There's some people that just need to be bringing people to Jesus. See, Andrew didn't have to be in front. Andrew didn't, remember, Andrew was the same person when Jesus was feeding the multitude of 5,000. It was Andrew that grabbed the little boy with the fish and, and bread and said, here's this boy that has something, now you can feed everybody. It was Andrew who learned and understood in his discipleship and everything that he has, was created to do. My job is to bring people to Christ. In order for Andrew to have this giftedness of bringing people to Christ, God had also gifted, gifted him with bringing people together, having relationships with people, talking to people, uh, uh, building relationships with people. He, you can't bring people to Jesus if you don't do the outreach. So when Jesus calls, some of y'all are already doing the outreach, and you're talking to a lot of people, you got all of these likes, you have all of these followers, but you're not bringing anybody to Christ. What is the purpose of having all these followers and all these likes on your posts and social media if you're not bringing anybody to Christ? God has to make it greater for you to understand your role. But he comes after um, um, John, but he existed before. Watch this. Behold, John says, the Lamb of God. Anytime you see behold in the Bible, anytime you see verily, verily in the Bible, anytime you say true, see truly in the Bible, you should take special note of what comes next. Because this is attention getting in the Bible. This is behold, verily, verily, truly. These are words in the Bible that says, I need your undivided attention. I need you to pay attention of what I'm about to say next. Uh, John the Baptist says, behold, Listen up. Can I have your attention? Get your head up. Sit up straight. Put your feet flat on the floor. John is saying, I need you to focus and listen to what I'm saying. I know you're my mentees. I know I baptize people in water. But here comes the Lamb of God. Well, what does that mean? 
What does that mean? Remember, John the Baptist's whole mission is to remember that this person, my wife, has greater importance around her and it's not just me. So John the Baptist has to make Jesus bigger than himself because he's here for others in everybody. Y'all getting this? All right. So um, John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. In other words, John the Baptist says, there's someone that's coming that's greater than me. There's someone who is coming that I can't even, the Bible says, untie his sandals. That means I can't even through my service touch him. I'm not even worthy enough, even if I was serving Jesus, to touch him. He's greater than me. He comes, he was there before me. He comes after, but he's, he was there before me. He is the one that's going to baptize you in spirit. I want y'all to understand, it's not me, John the Baptist, is saying, I know y'all follow me. I know you hear my teaching, but John the Baptist want to make it clear. Don't get it twisted. I'm just a messenger. I'm not the, uh, the person standing and sitting right next to God. I want y'all to know, I'm just like you, sent on assignment. John the Baptist makes it clear, because he don't want nobody to be confused, because some pastors do, that they think they're God. And they think they sit right next to God. John the Baptist said, let's make this one thing clear. I'm not who you may think I am. I'm a messenger sent by God, but I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Father, and I'm not the Holy Spirit. But it's interesting, because he used to describe Jesus as the lamb. Jesus is the lamb. Now, in the Old Testament Hebrew days, lambs were only for one purpose primarily, sacrifice. Lambs were used to sacrifice. It's interesting that John points out that Jesus is the lamb of God, which means that he has been sent to die for you. Y'all missed it. John the Baptist says, here comes someone that comes after me but was before me. I come to baptize you in water, but he is coming to baptize you in spirit and get a kick out of this. He is going to die for you. Y'all missing it? I'm not dying for you. I wasn't sent here to die for you because I can't atone your sins. I baptize you in water. Water means nothing without the Holy Spirit. That's why baptisms are the way they are now. John the Baptist makes it clear. I can't do what this dude that's coming can do for you. And he wasn't like most pastors and say, I need to keep all my sheep at my church. Because see, if he was like that, he wouldn't have never told them that Jesus was coming or he seen Jesus. He said that Jesus was walking by. He pointed out there is Jesus. See, sometimes we try to cuddle our sheep. If someone here, beloved, decide to go to another church, blessings to you, we pray for you, we'll walk you through it. Period. If it's something greater for you, how dare I block it? John the Baptist understands, I have to introduce you to the one that, I forgot to say it again, that was there before me but comes after me. I was sent by God. God sent me on this mission, but I know there's someone coming because I've been in that presence of God that I know something is coming greater. Behold the Lamb of God. The sacrifice is coming. They heard the Messiah because of the Old Testament. They knew someone was coming, but John makes it clear. This is the Lamb. A Lamb is an innocent, an innocent animal. Just imagine that John says, the Lamb of God, this innocent, pure, natural, soft, kind-hearted animal is going to be crucified for you. It's the Lamb of God. So first, John helps them understand it's bigger than me. Second, he helped them understand um, it is the Lamb of God. And what I love about it, it's the Lamb of God, not sent by any other man. It's the Lamb of God. This is directly from heaven. But thirdly, 
He helped them understand by saying the Lamb of God, whenever a lamb is sacrificed and, and, and for your sins, there's an atonement for your sins. There's forgiveness for your sins. There's this jazzy word called propitiation, where, where it's the propitiation of God. And what the propitiation means is, is that not only will your sins be forgiven, but God's wrath will be blocked. Y'all got to get this. It's simple words, behold the Lamb of God, but it's mean much more to you than you can ever imagine. Because John the Baptist says, don't get this thing twisted. It's not about me, it's about Jesus. Don't get it twisted. He is the sacrifice. I'm not dying for you. Don't get it twisted. I can't help you for those sins, and I can't, I can't block God's wrath. Right, right, right. Powerful word. John the Baptist helped them understand that Jesus is greater. Yeah. Yeah. So when Jesus shows up in there by the boat and Jesus says, follow me, I will make you fishers of men, they immediately dropped their nets and followed him. Now we understand because John the Baptist had primed them several of chapters or passages before that, primed them to get ready. He is here. He's not coming. He's here. So I can drop my net and follow him. Because John had made him bigger. So they had more value in him. This, their level of importance in Jesus was greater. It's a powerful thing. When the person that's closest to you understand that you were sent by God. That you were created by God. It's a powerful thing. I don't care what marriage you're in, what relationship you're in, what grade you're in. It doesn't matter. When the people around you understand that I was sent by God, I was created by God to be here, and my impact and my devotion and my commitment is not just you. So when I take a call at night or somebody stop by my house and say, Pastor, I need to speak with you, no matter what's going on in my household, she has to understand I've been called to serve many. So my value to her goes up, not because I'm special, because she understands the triangular relationship we have. She understands that God has called him to do a work. In order for him to do a work, I can't put a lasso on his work. But I can love him more and value him more, not because he all of that. No, it's because she understands God has called me to do a work. See, it's better to be in relationships when you understand that God has placed these people in your life. Now you gain more value in them. But they're in your life to bless you, but to bless other people. See, if you're in a relationship, young people, watch this, and you're in the relationship that you're in, hear me closely, pulls you away from people that you're supposed to be blessing, that person that's pulling you in is not for you. Because they don't understand spiritually God created you to bless the world. Spread the gospel. They're no good to you if they say, no, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be helping them. You shouldn't be giving that. You should, you should be right here with me. Demonic. Right. 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 We all should have an understanding of one another as the body of Christ. I can support your agenda if it's going to be for the glory of God. Because I know that God created you to do a work. I can humble myself and understand that you don't have to be devoted to me. I need you to be devoted to God, not beloved, not Pastor Leon. Be devoted to God because that's what's going to put you back in the chairs. That's what's going to wake you up every Sunday. That's what's going to get you to sing. That's what's going to get you to serve. That's what's going to get you to help other people. Because now we understand why Jesus is, was sent. See, to be a great disciple, we've been doing this thing all wrong because we don't have the undergirding of the word of God. Jesus is preparing these disciples. This is their call, not their lesson. This is their call. There's a lesson in their initial encounter with Jesus. Follow me. In order for you to do this work, you have to know who I am and who sent me. And, they, and here's the thing, Peter and Andrew wasn't traitors. 
See, some of us would see it as traitors. You betrayed. Why would you leave John the Baptist? He was on the scene before Jesus. John wasn't a hater. He didn't say, yo, nah, that's Jesus, but y'all should roll with me. Y'all have to understand this because this is all on a whole other spiritual level. There's some decisions in your life that you're going to make that people are going to try to hold you back from. But if it's a spiritual decision, go with it. Others will say, nah, stand there, hang in there. She loves you, he loves you. That's your girl, that's your boy. Hang, hang, hang. No, if God is calling you, you have to separate yourself. His job is to set us apart. And you have to operate here. Peter and Andrew have to be strong here. Here's why. There's another boat that we'll talk about next week. John and James is in that boat. <laughs> Jesus didn't talk to John and James before he talked with Peter and Andrew. Right, right. Yeah. So it's important that you make the right decision here because somebody is watching. There's some other people in another boat living in the same situation. The Bible doesn't say John and James caught fish and Peter and Andrew didn't. Nobody caught fish right there at that moment. So they're watching. Just imagine you, John and James, and you watch Peter and Andrew drop their nets and follow Jesus. You have to be at least spiritually curious to say, I'm going to go see what's going on. The decisions you make, young people, you don't know who's watching, but it may change their life. That's right. It will make a difference in their life. Yeah. All because you stood on the promises of God. Yeah. What do I mean? Jesus says, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say I'm thinking about it. He didn't say come hang out, let me show you something. He said, I will make you. In other words, his word is definite. That's, right. That's a declarative statement. That's not a baby. Trust God. Young people, trust God. This summer, trust God. Make the decision that's right in God's eyes. This is good discipleship work and conversation. Good discipleship work and conversation. A disciple is a person who follows Christ. What good is it? Stand up, Pat. Bet. What good is it for me to come to an understanding that I love and value her more? by knowing all the people's lives she's touched. What good is it for me to place so much value if she never touches the lives of other people? What happens is I build her up and I stay committed to her, mm -hmm. but I don't see the Lord because I make her God. See, I make her God because I don't see the other branches and the other fruit of her labor. So I just continue to value her. And so I start my day with, what do you need? I start my day with, how can I help you? But once I understand that she's on a call from God and she has fruit and branches that she has to attend to, then I understand, how can I help you do the work of the Lord? So it becomes bigger than her because now I understand the branches that God has given her and the leaves that have to grow and the fruit that have to come from that vine. But if I keep it here, I will build her up to where she'll think she's God. And that's dangerous because she'll be my God. But for me to really love her unconditionally in God's eyes is for me to understand that God has called her to do a work. 
So now my love and affection for her goes in support of her ministry, her purpose, her goals, her ambitions. And then I also understand that I also can be a distraction because I can help distract her and have her withdraw from her calling. We call it the enemy is trying to stop me from doing what God has called me to do. Sometimes it's us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist says, I got to make Jesus bigger and greater for them to fully understand because they're so committed to me. I need to get them off of me and on Jesus. So he made it real simple and clear. Y'all need to go and follow Jesus. My job is done. All I was supposed to do is prime and get you ready. But now he has come. I need to surrender you and turn you over. Parents, there come a day in our life when our children grow to a point where they have to be independent of us and dependent on God. If you don't remember nothing else this morning, independent of you and dependent on God. Because they have been called to a work. And their stumbling blocks is part of their work. We had to learn that ourselves as a couple. That their stumbling blocks, our children's stumbling blocks is part of their work because it's preparation for their branches, their fruit, their leaves. Right. Amen. I don't want you to walk out of here thinking, Jesus, God didn't call me. Here's the danger with the calling that I've learned in just a short time of being a pastor. We think calling means pastor. Wrong. Calling is serve. They had titles in the Bible, high priests, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes. Jesus, I'm here to serve. Your calling is serve. That's when people say we all, we all are called, we are all called to serve. Pastoral ship is a title but my commitment to God's people is through service. Right. Amen. You are all called to be and do something. Don't get caught up. Do the work. Do the work. Jesus will make you fill in the blank. For the fishermen, I will make you fishers of men. You fill in the blank. I will make you what? What is it that God has called you to do? That's a beautiful thing. After you fill in the blank, follow him immediately. Don't wait. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. There may be someone here today that, who don't know Jesus Christ as their personal savior and uh, you know in your heart that you want to follow him. You may perhaps don't know how to do it. You, you want to come in contact with God and you want to surrender, but you really don't know how to do it. It's, 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 it's real simple, right? Uh, there's some verbiage, but then there's a heart commitment. And then there's a behavior commitment. All of this builds and helps shapes you. And here's the thing that I find interesting, that God has never necessarily removed his hands from you. He's just waiting on you. If we are clay, and I talked about this last week. There must be a sermon coming. <laughs> if we are clay, the potter, while the wheel is turning 
and the tension is growing and brewing. The potter never really removed their hands from the clay. And they used the tension of the wheel and the spin of the wheel and a little bit of watering, that fresh water that we need to soften the clay and reshape you. But what I love about it, no matter what mistake you make, he never takes his hands off you. You will not be perfect, but he loves you. And he will continue to shape and mold you. Why? Because you filled in the blank. In agreement and covenant with God, I will make you. If you don't know what to put in the blank, ask God. Use me for what, God? What is it that you want me to do? Because I want my sentence complete. I will make you what? Jesus, reveal it to me. Tell me what you're going to make me. Why was I created? What is my purpose? It starts with accepting Jesus Christ in your life. You repent and say, God, forgive me for my sins. That I've been living outside of your will. I believe that you sent your only begotten son to live, to die, to be buried, and on the third day to be resurrected. And now he sits with you as an agent for me to speak for me, to intercede for me. But Jesus not only went back to heaven to be with God, he left the Holy Spirit. So we do have a comforter to help us. You're not alone. Even in your darkest moments, you're not alone. Because darkness is the absence of light. All you have to do is turn the light back on. Step outside of darkness. It's amazing how much God has in store for us on the other side of the door. But we never touch the door and push it open. Push the door open. There's light on the other side. Or better yet, you are light. Do you ever stand in darkness if you are already light? God loves you. And he wants me to tell you that he loves you. When you pray tonight, or the next time you pray, just ask God, reveal to me, God, what is it that you have called me to do? No matter what age, there are people 40, 50 years old still trying to understand their purpose in life. That goes for you as well. Ask God. He will reveal it to you. Amen? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hey, thank you once again for tuning in. Pastor Leon signing off. Now it's your turn to do the work. Uh, what does that mean? That means you have to take the next step so God can take the next 20, 40, 60 steps in your life uh, on the new me journey. Um, thank you for uh, being with us and hearing from God and God's word. He blessed us and we trust and believe and we hope and we pray that he was the word was a blessing to you. If you want more information about Beloved Community Church, we ask that you visit our website at belovedcc.org. That's beloved, the letter C, C for community church. Dot org. You can also email us at belovedcol3 uh, at gmail.com. That's belovedcolossians3 at gmail.com. So there's plenty of ways to um, uh, contact us, our Facebook, whether it's Twitter, Twitter or Instagram. We got all the social media that you need. But most importantly, we have the word of God. And so if God can reach us, then he's given us a power and the resource to reach you. I just want to encourage everybody today, if you haven't given your life to Christ, you can do so. All right. I don't want you to wait to be in a church edifice to do so. You can do that right now by saying, God, forgive me of my sins. God, I believe that you sent your only begotten son to live, to die, to be buried, and now resurrected uh, uh, with you, O Lord. And now I have complete and direct access to you, O Lord. And that is the, the, the formula for salvation. And so you don't have to be in a church home. You can say that to yourself right now, and God will forgive you. He doesn't hold grudges. He'll remember race and clean that slate but here's the important part that you have to do now you have to get um, in an educated environment where you can learn more about God and so that you can receive instruction and use your gifts and talents to help build the kingdom 
here on earth. We have a lot of ministry opportunities. We're launching new things in 2018. Our marriage ministry is going to go stronger and harder this year. We're launching a women's ministry. We want, we're launching a men's ministry. We're, we're going to launch a family ministry because we want you to understand the totality of what God has put together that no man can undo. So we just trust and believe that you'll find us at 6824 Democracy Drive, beloved community church. We love you. God bless. And remember, don't forget the new me journey. Amen.